Sure. When, when are they proposing? Noon? Okay. Okay. What was that? About noon. They're going to be ready. Sure. We're going to uh, see. So you need us to click it at, at high noon. No problem. Do you need to make an announcement now? No. Guys, we're on point to eat at uh, 12 o'clock, so we're going to get into page 17, chapter 2, and I invite you to take your pen and underline the letter A. There is a solution. This is the only thing that we found to combat alcoholism since man began crushing grapes. And I have a question, a personal question. What happened to this warm, wonderful, balmy, 80-degree weather? I'm freezing my butt off. Just saying. Save it for tomorrow. <laughs> um, anytime they, they use the word we, us, they're referring to the first 100 in this book, okay? And if you ever remember anything from the third grade in your little English class, A is singular. A is one. So Alcoholics Anonymous has one solution. They're not saying this is the only way to do it. If you get sober in the church, then that's great, you know. But here in Alcoholics Anonymous, we have one solution. So when you walk in here and you're a woman, we don't say, oh, well, you take this book. <laughs> if you're a Harley rider, oh, well, you get this one. You know, if, if, if you're sexual orientation is, is different, oh, well, you get this book. We all have a solution in Alcoholics Anonymous, and this is what the first 100 shared with us. This is how they did it, and they got success. And we haven't seen any reason to change it for 76 and a half years. We of Alcoholics Anonymous know thousands of men and women who are just as hopeless as Bill. Hopeless. Nearly all have recovered. There's that silly word. They have solved the drink problem. So they're kind of redundant. So nope. recovered means that we've solved the problem. I don't get up every day and, and make a decision whether or not I'm going to drink. It just it's not, it's not part of the gig. We're average Americans, all sex. I know y'all hate to hear that out here in California, that you're average. Y'all are always thinking you might stand out a little bit. All sections of this country and many of its occupants are represented, as well as many political, economic, social, and religious backgrounds. We're a people who normally would not mix. But there exists among us a fellowship, a friendliness, and an understanding which is indescribably wonderful. We're like the passengers of a great liner the moment after rescue from shipwreck when camaraderie, joyousness, and Democracy pervade the vessel from steerage to captain's table. Bill is a great writer. He really is. I'll never take anything away from him in this arena. And at the writing of this book, the Titanic and the Lusitania had just met uh, Watery Graves. And he makes this reference because he knew the readers would remember those two great tragedies. And lucky for us, we can still see Leonardo DiCaprio hanging off the bow of that ship, you know, and those people floating in the water with the ice, uh, the, the, in the icy water. So he, if he were writing to fishermen, he'd talk to you about bait and fishing poles. If he was talking to you about sheep herders, he'd talk to you about dogs and staffs and, and sheep. So in this particular deal, he says, you know, um, we're like, just like these passengers who have met a watery disaster, and they all of a sudden, no matter what their social standing, they come together in unity to become one. And that's what he's talking about. Unlike the feelings of the ship's passengers, however, our joy in escape from disaster does not subside as we go our individual ways. In other words, you have recovered. You don't just say, well, okay, next. No, we dig that much harder into helping other people. And he says, the feeling of having shared in a common peril, that's the problem is the one element in the powerful cement which binds us. And then here's a fellowship warning. That in itself would never have held us together if we are now joined. That is a fellowship warning. 
There's two AAs. There's us. We are the fellowship. Need you. You're important. I love you. You're vital to my recovery because I need, to, I need you to show me what you did. I need you to walk me through what you did. I need your experience. And then there's the program of Alcoholics Anonymous right here. Untouched, unchanged since its original writing in 1937. So, but the fellowship, and y'all have them. I mean, they're hanging out on the sidewalk smoking cigarettes with their attendance sheets on the desk. We have it every week, every week at We Are Not a Glum Lot. This is where we talk about a common solution because we, we share a common problem. So this is the fellowship warning. That would never have held us together as we are now joined. And what Bill eloquently wrote when he's making the analogy of the uh, shipwreck victims, you know, you got some that's just been eating spam down the bowels of the, of the ship, and, and the other people are in tuxes and wearing fur coats and uh, eating caviar. But when they get to the bank, the ones in the fur coats and the tuxes go to the limousine. We, in turn, as alcoholics, turn around and go back in the water and get another one. We don't stop. This thing isn't an event for us. It's a, a way of life. And that's what Bill's alluding to. That's the, that's the unity that we have. Yeah, I got mine. Thank you, God. Thank you for removing the obsession for me to drink. Oh, Lord, thank you. And the only way I give that back is go find another Charlie. That's the only way. And that's what Bill's alluding to in his analogy. The tremendous fact for every one of us is that we have discovered a common solution. Promise. We have a way out which we can absolutely agree. Promise. And upon which we can join in brotherly and harmonious action. Not love, but action. Promise. This is, this is a very important sentence, y'all. This is the great news this book carries to those who suffer from alcoholism. The great news is the gospel. So the great news is there is a solution. Not the fellowship. This book carries the solution to our disease. Flip over to page 18, skip down to the third full paragraph, actually the fourth full paragraph in italics. In the squiggly line. But the ex-problem drinker who has found this solution, who is properly armed with the facts about himself, can generally win the entire confidence of another alcoholic in a few hours. Now, until such an understanding is reached, <laughs> little or nothing can be accomplished. We're uniquely equipped to talk and, and relate to someone who's suffering from the disease of alcoholism. Let's go saying. to page 20, the first full paragraph, please. You may have already asked yourself. Why is it that all of us became so very ill from drinking? Doubtless you are curious to discover how and why. In the face of expert opinion to the contrary, we have recovered from a hopeless condition of mind and body. And there's your definition for opinion. It's a belief or judgment insufficient to produce complete certainty. So what they're saying is for years and years and years, experts are saying they're going to have to be locked away, undergo all these rat, rab, uh, lab rat kind of experimentation because they're alcoholics. So expert opinion falls short. We have found a solution, and it has nothing to do with lobotomies or or shock treatments, or hydrotherapy. It's found in a spiritual nature. Now here's a condition. If you are an alcoholic who wants to get over it, you may already be asking, what do I have to do? Well, let's answer that question. It is the purpose of this book to answer such questions specifically. Not in a roundabout way, or kind of, sort of. We're going to answer it specifically. It goes back to that hummingbird cake recipe. We shall tell you what we have done. Not what we think. Before going into detailed discussion, it may be well to summarize some points as we see them. How many times people have said to us, I can take it or leave it alone, why can't he? Why don't you drink like a gentleman or quit? How do gentlemen drink? I don't know, but they don't quit. 
That fella can't handle his liquor. Why don't you try beer and wine? Lay off the hard stuff. His willpower must be weak. You know, he could stop if he wanted to. She's such a sweet girl. I would think he'd stop for her sake. I mean, really? I mean, the doctor told him that if he ever drank again, it would kill him. But there he is, all lit up again. Frothy emotional appeal. And behind this, it says, now these are commonplace observations on drinkers, which we hear all the time. This is society's opinion of us. But in back of these opinions and observations is a world of ignorance and misunderstanding. That's why this book has its advantages for all. It tells all facets of our society what drives us. Make sense? Up to this point, we I mean, during the break, two or three people have come up and we've talked about moral uh, insufficiency. It has nothing to do with morals. Not a damn thing. We're as morally fit as anybody else on the planet. We just can't quit drinking. It's a phenomenon of craving. Behind this sort of back of them is a world of ignorance and misunderstanding. Please highlight and underline that. We see these expressions refer to people whose reactions to alcohol is very different than ours. The girl that went riding on the motorcycle with me that wanted a weak uh, uh, margarita. She doesn't understand. And I damn sure don't understand her. I remember a guy asked me once, he said, Dad gum, Charlie, you drunk again? I said, no, still. <laughs> <laughs> now, Bill's going to give us some examples, and you can ask yourself these questions. These are three types of drinkers that he's going to cover. All right, let's talk about a moderate drinker. They have little trouble in giving up liquor entirely if they have good reason for it. They can take it or leave it alone. They don't get a lot of press in this book. <laughs> then we have a certain type of hard drinker, type number two. He may have the habit badly enough to gradually impair him physically and mentally. And make no mistake, our rooms are full of hard drinkers, and it's okay. Come in, have our crappy coffee, and, and take a donut. Grab a seat. Have fun. We're good people to hang around with. But they're hard drinkers. Given a sufficient reason, they can put the plug in the jug and not drink. Because it may cause him to die a few years before his time. But if sufficiently strong reasons, such as ill health, falling in love, oh, Lordy, that'll do it, change of environment, <laughs> or the warning of a doctor becomes operative, this man can also stop or moderate, although he may find it difficult and troublesome and may even need medical attention. I love the story that Earl Hightower tells about uh, the hard drinker that goes to court. And the judge says, Mr. Smith, if I see you back in my courtroom again for operating a motor vehicle while under the influence of alcohol, you're going to county for 90 days. This guy just doesn't drink and drive. And then Earl shows up and he says, Mr. Hightower, if I see you back in my courtroom again for operating a motor vehicle while under the influence of alcohol, you're going to county for 90. Earl says, well, I start wondering what it's going to be like in jail because I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. I mean, I drink or drive no matter what. <laughs> Type number three, what about the real alcoholic? That's me, the guy on page 21. Now, he may start off as a moderate drinker. He may or may not become a continuous hard drinker. But at some stage of his drinking career, he begins to lose all control of his liquor consumption once he starts to drink. So you can look back on your life. There's three, three examples. Do you really belong here? Do you? Only you can answer that question. The frothy emotional pill, everybody that's been in our lives for all these years, that ain't keeping us from drinking. How about them people that can make a decision whether or not they're going to drink on, every day? Those people ought to be greeters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You hear people say, well, I woke up this morning and decided I wasn't going to drink today. I made the decision. Hmm. Well, good for you. My hat's off to you, Bubba. There you go. My hat's off. Flip to over to page 24, first full paragraph in squiggly writing. Now, if you want to argue about something, here's you something to argue about. The fact is that most alcoholics, for reasons yet obscure, has lost the power of choice in drink. Our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. We're unable at certain times to bring into our consciousness with sufficient force 
the memory of the suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. We are without defense against the first drink. You remember that day you wake up and you say, I'm not going to drink today. And you tie that string around your finger. About 5 o'clock you go, I'm not going to drink today. About 6.30 you go, I'm not going to drink on an empty stomach. <laughs> remember those? By 9 o'clock you say, what's this damn string around my finger for? We was talking the other night, and Randy said, yeah, I remember. I, I used to give the bartender my keys because I knew what was going on. <laughs> then about a quarter to two, he's beating the hell out of the bartender. Give me my keys. <laughs> I got to go. <laughs> I'm just drunk enough to drive now. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready now. Skip down the last paragraph on page 24. When this sort of thinking is fully established in an individual with alcoholic tendencies. He has he probably placed himself beyond human aid. And unless locked up, may die or go permanently insane. These are Bill's, you, you can see Bill Wilson's story all over this. These stark and ugly facts have been confirmed by legions of alcoholics throughout history. But for the grace of God. Grace? What is grace, Larry Boy? Grace is uh, probably the most powerful word in our entire text. It, it, the definition is undeserved favor. Or if you prefer unmerited mercy um, best way that you would understand it is thank God I didn't get what I deserved there would have been thousands more convincing demonstrations so many want to stop but cannot there is a solution almost none of us like the self -search searching the leveling of our pride the convictions of shortcomings which the process requires for a successful consummation but we saw that it really worked in others, and we had to come to believe in the hopelessness and futility of life as we had been living it. When, therefore, we were approached by those in whom the problem had been solved, recovered, there was nothing left for us but to pick up the simple kit of spiritual tools laid at our feet. We have found much of heaven, and we have been rocketed into the fourth dimension of existence of which we had not even dreamed. Conscious contact with God. The great fact is just this and nothing else, <clears throat> that we have had deep and effective spiritual experiences, which have revolutionized our whole attitude toward life, toward our fellows, and towards God's universe. The entire purpose of this book is to change one thing, make no mistake, to change our attitude about ourselves, when we come in, we've got the worst self-esteem problem of any creature on the planet Earth. And we're really not bad people. Our second attitude is about our fellows, because when we're not feeling good about ourselves, we're sure our perception of others sucks. They, 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 they don't like us. Not true. Incorrect, incorrect belief. And the third attitude is about God and his universe. Mine, my experience was, I got here, I believed that God existed, but he wanted nothing to do with me. I'd used up my get-out-of-jail-free cards, and I'd beat up and, and harmed so many of his kids. And I was so wrong. So by doing this work and following this, this, this outline program of action, all those attitudes get changed. Today, I know I'm not a bad guy. And today, I know that people all over the world love me. Some people don't like me, but I'm okay with that. And I know that God has my best interest in heart. I know that God does for me on a regular basis what I could not do for myself. So that's what we're talking about here. And you notice an asterisk uh, by the, the term spiritual experiences down at the bottom. It says fully explained in Appendix 2. Bill's going to bring this up a couple of times, and we're going to wait until he begs us a little bit later on, and then we'll flip over to that appendix and finally read it. My experience with this paragraph that we were just reading when I was going, starting this journey with my sponsor, I was telling David, David, he's really only told me two things to do in 18 years. The first thing he told me to do is, Charlie boy, you're going to have to quit fighting alcohol because you're going to lose every time. And you better quit messing around with God because you're way out of your league. 
I can understand that. And I said, but David, you don't know all my story. But I have broken most of the laws of man. <laughs> but I have broken all of God's laws. <coughs> all of them. Why in the world would he help me? And he gave me the greatest answer another recovered alcoholic can give the new man. He said, Charlie boy, because he said he would. That's exactly what this paragraph is telling us. <coughs> we don't go down the scale too far. We're God's kids and he loves us. And when we turn to him, remarkable things happen. The central fact of our lives today is the absolute certainty that our Creator has entered into our hearts and lives in a way which is indeed miraculous. Do you, this sentence has always kind of tripped me up. Did he enter into our hearts and lives or lives? Both of them fit. And it doesn't really matter. Who said both? Charlotte. Well, of course. Works for me. Would you sponsor me? He has commenced to accomplish those things for us, which we could never do by ourselves. Guys, keep in mind, there's some, the, the, the words in this book, if, if you focus on them, it's like indeed miraculous. We can't explain it. That's what miraculous, it's what miracle, phenomena, phenomena, uh, all, th those are all things that can't be explained. They just are, and we accept them. I said last night, I said somewhere between step two and step seven, and we'll point this out in a little bit, God shows up. And I'm, I can't tell you the day that God showed up in my life. I didn't have a white flash or a burning bush. I just know that he did. And somewhere in the book will verify what I'm telling you. Somewhere between two and seven, God shows up. And you know he's there. You're going, dude, where did you come from? <laughs> you know? It's kind of like that footprints thing. If you are as seriously alcoholic as we were, we believe there's no middle-of-the-road solution. And this is the thing we've been hammering, and we're going to hammer it. Middle-of-the-road solution, just don't drink and go to meetings. Just don't drink or use no matter what. If your ass falls off, throw it up in a wheelbarrow and bring it on back to the meeting. We'll be here about 8 o'clock. You know, just say no. How about that one with Nancy Reagan and her little band of merry men? You see where I'm going with this? That's a middle-of-the-road solution. If I could just not drink and go to meetings, my ass would be home riding a Harley-Davidson motorcycle this afternoon. You hear what I'm saying? I don't know how to do that. I drink or use no matter what. I've got to have something with depth and weight. I need you to show me what you did, and I don't need to back off and just show up every now and then. i got to stay vigilant. There is no middle-of-the-road solution for an alcoholic of my type. You know, this... This whole deal says we carry the message to the suffering alcoholic. A lot of people think you don't drink for a day or two. Well, I'll just run over to Cypress Church and make a pot of coffee and sit around and wait on them to show up. That ain't what it says whatsoever. And I am so proud to know some of you people in Chapter 7 because you don't do that. We'll go where they are. We carry Domino's Delivers. We were in a position where life was becoming impossible. And if we had to pass into the region from which there was no return through human aid. Human aid, wives, husbands, children, friends, superior courts, court judges. Yeah, doctors. Those are human beings. And we don't tap the brake with those cats, man. We had but two alternatives. And what's that? Well, one of them was to go on to the bitter end, Larry Boy, blotting out the consciousness of our intolerable situation the best we could. Or, and the other is to accept spiritual help. Hmm. In other words, take step two, Charlie boy. Take step two. This we did because we honestly wanted to and were willing to make the effort. And we're going to have to cut it off right there because we're about to get okay. into a portion that uh, is kind of long uh, because we're, getting, we're about to find the solution. We are ending at the uh, end of the first paragraph on the top of page 26. And I think Brother Tyler has some announcements for us.